Police say they are growing increasingly concerned for the welfare of a missing woman. Sarah Everard was last seen walking home from a friend's house in South London on Wednesday evening. It's now a week into the search for missing Sarah Everard, and today detectives moved their search to here in Ashford. Just what happened to the 33-year-old has taken, detectives said, a deeply disturbing turn after closing in on one of their own Metropolitan Police officers last night, this house in Deal, Kent. On the night of the 3rd of March 2021, police officer Wayne Cousins kidnapped, raped and murdered 33-year-old marketing executive Sarah Everard. It was a murder that shook the nation and shattered people's trust in the police. An innocent woman was taken from the street as she was walking home. The fact that the man who's been arrested is a serving Metropolitan Police officer is both shocking and deeply disturbing. Sarah's murder led to public outrage, creating questions for both society and the police. What drove Cousins to commit such a despicable act? And more importantly, could he have been stopped? To try and even begin to understand such a horrendous crime, I've brought together a crack team of experts. Former Detective Superintendent Julie Mackay, a top anti-corruption officer, psychologist Serena Simmons, and retired Met murder detective Howard Groves. With the help of these authorities on murder, I'm going to try and unravel what happened in this case and how the killer exploited his knowledge of police techniques to first commit and then try and cover up his appalling crime. Ex-detective Superintendent Julie Mackay has spent 15 years bringing bent coppers to justice. But even with her years of experience, this case was on another level. So the 3rd of March 2021 is the day that's ingrained on a lot of people's memory. It's the day that Wayne Cousins met Sarah Everard for the very first time and also for the last time. And he became, I think, one of the most significant cops that killed in history. And the reason for that is because of all the planning that went into it. We know that he'd started his preparation weeks earlier. He's been seen in January and February driving around that area, identifying a suitable route to go on, looking at areas where he's going to find lone women who are going to be there, easy for him to engage in. I think he was choosing an area where he wouldn't stand out as a plainclothes police officer. So if he'd have gone to somewhere really dark, back street, maybe it would have been more questionable than where he was. He's a man who's visited London on three occasions prior to going up to actually abducting her. He's deliberately hired a car that looks like a police vehicle so that when he then goes to find his victim, he can carry off this facade of being on duty and he's a safe person to go with. The level of planning Cousins used in this murder is deeply disturbing. To understand how something like this could have happened, I need to immerse myself in Sarah's last hours. So I'm gonna need to see the CCTV and investigate her movements on that fateful night. So it's really important part of the investigative process is to find where she's last seen, what she did, what she was wearing, who she's with, how she's behaving. And CCTV is crucial because you'll have a CCTV timeline. So this is the compilation of all the CCTV footage. So that's ring doorbell of her going. On the way to the supermarket there. Yeah. Is that Sarah? In the jeans? Waiting to go in, yeah. Is her here? Yeah. Going into the stall, and you'll see her coming in through that door. There she is on the phone. Got a mask on. Yeah. Is she going home here? No, this is at 6 o'clock, so she's just on her way out now to go and see a friend. What time? Did Wayne Cousins abduct her? Half past nine, she's on the phone to her boyfriend. So and I think it's between half nine and quarter to ten. It's horrible knowing, looking at this, knowing what we know. Yeah, and then what happens to her? To find out more about who Sarah was, 
I've come to meet journalist and South London resident Claire Cohen, who covered this horrific story. Can you tell me a little bit about Sarah Everard? Who was she? Sarah had a great job, worked really hard in her marketing career. She had a long-term boyfriend. And really, I think we all know a Sarah. Yeah. Sarah could be your sister, she could be your daughter. She was incredibly close to her parents and her sisters. So her sister spoke about going to Sarah's flat and finding washing hanging up there that was waiting to be put away yeah. and finding parcels by the front door that were waiting to be taken to the post office. Things that we all have in our houses, right? And that we think we're going to be able to do tomorrow. But what if we can't? And why is this area significant here? This supermarket over the road is where Sarah was caught on CCTV buying a bottle of wine as any of us might if we were on the way to our friend's house for dinner, never imagining for a second that the CCTV of her doing such an innocuous action would become really significant and would be splashed across the news in the coming days. Less than a mile down the road from the supermarket on Pointers Road is where Wayne Cousins stopped Sarah Everard. And as you can see, this is an incredibly busy road. When she was taken, we were in a national lockdown, but as someone who lives in this area, I can tell you this road is never quiet. I was coming for walks in this area myself during the lockdown. It's always busy. Sarah wouldn't have thought for a second that she would be in any danger. It was at a time of COVID. The UK was in its third national lockdown. And at the time, there was widespread confusion about rules on socialising, something Cousins used to his advantage. She thought that she was walking home from seeing a friend, that she bent lockdown rules, and so when she was stopped by a police officer, showing her his ID with a pair of handcuffs, asking her, well, we don't know what he said, but presumably asking her to get into his car. But if he wouldn't have been a police officer, she wouldn't have got in the car. She trusted that, as any one of us would. She thought she'd done something wrong and that she was going to be, I don't know, taken in, whatever she thought, but she like all of us, was raised to believe that the police protect you, they keep you safe, they don't harm you. There was a massive cloud over what the rules were in lockdown, so the confusion of that helped Wayne Cousins do what he did, because he preyed on that. It was an atmosphere of paranoia, confusion, are we doing something wrong, are we not? And you're absolutely right, Wayne Cousins knew that. He knew that he could abuse that power to stage a false arrest, simple as that. The police had to plough through hundreds of hours of CCTV to painstakingly piece together exactly what had happened to Sarah on the night of the 3rd of March, 2021. Now, this is 9.25. So this is when she's on the way home, home and on the phone to her boyfriend. And there's Wayne Cousins' car. So I wonder if he spotted her. And that was a car he'd hired. It wasn't his own car. He's done all his prep. He's ready to go. There's Sarah. And that's her. It's really difficult to see from these images. And there, you can see he's stopped her. There. So he stopped right in front of her. See, hazards are on. Yeah. There he is. Got control of her. So this is the moment that we see Wayne Cousins meeting Sarah Everard, caught on the dash cam of a passing vehicle. Crucial bit of evidence, this. So what's this footage? And it shows the car with the door open. So this is Wayne Cousins in his car? Yep. And you see they just do it on repeat. So look at the time, 9.37 p.m. Right. Do you know, to find this bit of CCTV is like a needle in a haystack. So the pink arrow would be pointing to him there, and the yellow arrow would be pointing to her. Yeah. And that's him driving away now. So she's and she'll now in be the in car. that car. Oh. And then this is down in Dover, so half past eleven, so nearly two hours later. So she's still in that car with him. Do we think now he's already murdered her? I don't think he has yet because I think he takes her to Dover first, doesn't he? Where well, he is. She would have set. questioned, though, why am I in the car for this long? Oh. She would have been going crazy. She will know that something terrible is going to happen. That journey would have been the very worst. And she's stuck. Yeah. She's handcuffed behind her back in that car and cannot defend herself. Wow. And she'll probably be pleading for her life, won't she? 
what's so horrible about that is you see her just on a normal night out, just to go and see her friends, and within hours, she's in the back of a car, handcuffed. Being terrorised. The thought of how terrified Sarah must have been has made me feel physically sick. The pure horror of what was to come must have dawned on her as they drove towards Kent, realising that this police officer had gone rogue. After months of careful planning, on the night of the 3rd of March, 2021, Wayne Cousins abducted Sarah Everard from the side of the road. And by the next morning, the 33-year-old marketing executive would be dead. CCTV would play a vital role in cracking this case. One of the earliest pieces of evidence against Cousins showing his level of premeditation and planning came in the form of him hiring a car. So this shows Wayne Cousin three days before he kidnapped Sarah. Is it the car hire place then? So this is footage that was captured of Wayne Cousins in the background there in the white Vauxhall, pulling out of the car hire enterprise in Dover. Footage captured in the immediate aftermath of the abduction would be just as vital. As soon as the police found CCTV of Wayne Cousins driving off with Sarah in the car, they began to piece together what had happened to her. Top psychologist Serena Simmons and former Detective Chief Inspector Howard Groves will talk me through the clues. Together with forensic investigator Jim Fraser. Cousins would have known the extent of video surveillance, you know, CCTV cameras and automatic number plate readers. So it's hard to imagine that he wasn't alert to that. What he must have thought was that by the simple act of hiring a different vehicle, a vehicle that wasn't his and wasn't in any way connected to him, would be sufficient to break any link between him and an abduction that took place 80 or 90 miles away. Cousins may have also believed that as the country was in lockdown, his tracks would have been harder to follow. In Kent, Cousins forced Sarah out of the hire car into his own vehicle. He then drove her to a remote rural area northwest of Dover, which he knew well, where he packed up and raped her. A lot of crucial evidence was found in the car. There was the key from the handcuffs, which we know Sarah was wearing because there is other evidence to that effect. There is a blood stain which matched Sarah, a semen stain that matched Cousins. On the basis of that, I think we can safely say that that's where Sarah was initially attacked. At 2.31 a.m., Cousins was seen at a petrol station buying a drink. By this time, it's assumed that Sarah was dead. We don't know exactly when Sarah was killed or, or where she was killed. We do know how she was killed because she died of compression of the neck. She was strangled. And it's been reported that she may have been strangled by Cousins' police issue belt. Cousins then drove 30 miles away to Sandwich, Kent, where he threw Sarah's phone into the river, hoping it wouldn't be found. Inside the car, there was a fragment from a SIM card that was the same kind of SIM card that went in Sarah's phone. He then carried on with his daily routine as if nothing had happened. Immediately after the murder, Cousins was known to go about his normal daily activities. He went and got a coffee and cake, and in those following days, he called the vets, go on a walk, take his children out. And sometimes we struggle to make sense of why someone might do that in this situation. I think the thing I find hardest to get my head round about this case is after carrying out such a brutal rape and murder, Cousins just seemed to get on with his life as normal. It's not normal, is it? 
So we have to remember that someone like Cousins has this very, very rich fantasy life and he's used to switching his personality, this persona, on and off. So he's this person at work, he's this person at home. He would have been thinking about this crime for a long, long time. How can someone literally murder someone and then go and get a coffee an hour later? But for him, he'd replayed that in his mind so many times. It was just the act. He did what he needed to do, and so back to normal life I go. But no matter how hard he tried, Cousins couldn't escape what he had done or the likely consequences of being found out. He knew Sarah's body contained vital evidence if it was found, so he had to try and destroy it. Cousins was seen filling up a jerry can at a petrol station and from there went on to buy bin bags from a hardware store. During the course of the abduction, he tried to hide his tracks and destroy evidence. He had initially deposited Sarah's body in a woodland in Kent and then went back to burn the body. But he would never have been able to destroy the body by burning. He wouldn't be able to generate temperatures high enough. On the 5th of March, Cousins must have moved Sarah's burnt body in bin bags to a nearby pond where she was subsequently found. Some suspects feel the need to return to the scene of the crime. It, for whatever gratification they are, you and I cannot comprehend why they'd want to do that, but that's just the nature of what police officers sometimes encounter. I've heard occasions where a suspect has actually come to the scene and standing there watching police officers put the tapes up and do everything at, the, at a crime scene, and they stand in the background watching what's happening. So they get a kick out of it. They also probably come there to think, let me see what they're doing, let me hear what's been said. Sometimes they use it to find out as much as they can, ask other people, it's what the police saying. They use it for their own advantage, but it can also be macabre. Do you think, in your opinion, that he would be classed as a psychopath? I think that if he were to complete an assessment, he'll come out pretty high on that, and so, yeah, from from where I'm sat, and I haven't been able to interview him or assess him, I would say that he would um, be classified as having antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy, because he certainly shows the traits of that, that kind of way of functioning. That's not an excuse, though. Of course. The very nature of being a psychopath is that you are glib, you're charming, you're superficial, you can groom people, and all of the qualities that we see he has. So he used those qualities to his advantage. From what I've seen of what his movements were after he'd committed this horrendous crime, it was just a lack of empathy yeah. and no signs of remorse. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So people with a diagnosis of psychopathy um, definitely have that disconnect. So although they don't have genuine emotion, they know what emotions to display at the right time. Does that make sense? Yes, so yes, they would yeah. be able to cry at the right time if they needed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's part of their charm. And that's why they get away with things for so long, because they almost can behave as a bit of a perfect person, depending on where they are and what they're doing. Six days after Sarah Everard's disappearance, police officer Wayne Cousins thought he was in the clear. But just when he thought he'd got away with murder, the discovery of CCTV taken from a passing bus showed Cousins' hire car and gave the police a solid lead. The registration of the hire car pointed directly towards a rogue officer and detectives were dispatched to interview him. Serena is going to show me what happened in the initial interrogation of Wayne Cousins at his home in Kent on the 9th of March 2021. So we're here to talk to you about Sarah. I'm going to show you a picture. Do you know Sarah? I don't know. Okay. Sarah went missing. Um, I'll show you some pictures of her on the day. Sarah went missing um, on Wednesday. And her parents, obviously, and her family are really worried about her. Now, the inquiry that's been conducted so far has led us to come and speak to you about it and to see what we, what we know about Sarah, OK? So, would you like to... Do you know where Sarah is? No. Right. right. 
that's not a normal reaction to that. Do you know where Sarah is? No. If you were really being accused of something, it would be a very different response, I think. What do you mean? Why are you well, why here? Would I, why would I know where Sarah is? Yeah. I don't even know where Sarah is. Yeah, yeah, you'd be yeah. a bit... No. Agitated, no. Yeah, you, you can see it straight away, but, I mean, I know we know, but as soon as he's shown that picture of Sarah, he knows he's banging trouble. That deep breathing, I think he's, he's going completely into his head, he's trying to quickly fabricate a story as quickly as he possibly his can. His heart must be pounding. Do you know anything about what happened to me? I know that um, she went missing up in um, London somewhere um, what, about a week ago or so, uh, just from what I've got on the news. OK. Have you ever personally met her? No, not personally met her. you had any interactions with her at all? No, uh, why, why, why would I have personal interactions with her? So we know from other interactions like this, again, if you're being accused of something that you're actually innocent of, this is far too calm a reaction. This interview is just about trying to find her. Because well, she's been missing for a while well, now. I'm sat in handcuffs and mm. I know her. So you must have something to say that I, I know her. Well, like I said, you've been arrested on suspicion of kidnap. And we believe that you've been involved in her disappearance and taking her away from her family. Okay. So we are trying to find her. Later in the interview, Cousins gives his version of events, admitting that he did in fact meet Sarah and claiming that he'd been blackmailed by a gang to abduct her. I am in financial, um, and I've been um, lent on by, um, I don't know who they are, they're a, a group, a gang, whatever. Um, and they told me why I need to go and pick up girls and get them to them. So um, I said, what's happening? Um, and it then came through that they're going to harm my family, take them away, and they'll use them instead. Um, at that point, I had no option to try and find somebody. I don't, um, there's just a couple of names I was told a place to um, take her. That's it. That's all, that is all I know to this group of people. Tell me about them. I need to find them. Tell me everything you know. That okay. I that you'll help them. There was a white sprinter van. Um, they um, are was between sort of Lennon and Mainstone area. That I've got to off. He's picking on very generic information there. So, did you hear that? Yeah. So, a, a gang. A white van, yeah. a gang. They've asked me to pick up somebody or they're going to take one of my family. Yeah. He's literally just clutching at straws. And quickly kind of pulling on his knowledge, what he knows, what's going to be really evasive to the police. Surely, gonna... them people in that room can spot a liar a mile off. It's their job. <clears throat> they say, you've done good. And. <laughs> I don't know whether my family's going to be all right still. They, they, threatened, they threatened to take my family away from me. So, at that point, I'm, I'm doing what I can to protect my family. That's it. What's oh, interesting right. is he's now putting himself in victim mode. Right, OK. So, again, very emotionally intelligent. Yeah. Now, deflecting off what he's done, no, they're after me, they're after my family, I'm the victim here, you've got this all wrong, I'm the one that needs to be protected. So he's trying to deflect completely from his own actions. What this is telling me is he never for one minute thought they were coming to knock on his door because he would be more prepared and he isn't prepared because he's that arrogant and he's that sure of himself that he's thinking, they're not coming for me, I've got away with this. Yeah, I think you're right. When the police arrested Cousins on the 9th of March 2021, six days after Sarah's abduction and murder, they discovered his phone had been wiped, meaning potentially vital data was lost. But despite this, detectives were gathering a mountain of evidence that pointed towards his guilt. On the night of the 3rd of March 2021, 
33-year-old Sarah Everard was abducted and murdered while she was walking home in South London. Her killer was a serving Metropolitan Police Officer, Wayne Cousins. The news today that it was a Metropolitan Police Officer who was arrested on suspicion of Sarah's murder has sent shockwaves and anger through the public and through the Met. This area is the last place Sarah Everard will be seen alive. In the ultimate abuse of power, Wayne Cousins had managed to get her into the back of his car. And the most disturbing thing of all, she had no reason not to trust him. He was a cop. Just a few hours later, Sarah Everard would be dead. But what exactly had led to this point? And were there any warning signs in his past that were missed? Wayne Cousins was part of an elite branch of the Met Police's parliamentary guards. He used his position of power and authority to plan a brutal kidnap, rape and murder. So who was this monster? And how did he get to such a privileged position? Wayne Cousins was born in Dover, Kent, on the 20th of December, 1972. He came from a tight-knit, seemingly ordinary family. His father was a well-liked local business owner and a family man. We don't really know much about his early life, but between 1990 and 2011, he worked at his dad's garage. Whilst working at the garage, he took up several voluntary and paid roles in both the military reserves and Kent Police. He also went on to protect power plants like Dungeon S for the Civil Nuclear Constabulary. And in 2006, he met a Ukrainian scientist who later became his wife and mother to his children. Fast forward to 2015, and there were reports of cousins being involved in an alleged indecent exposure incident whilst working at Kent Police. This surely should have raised a red flag and disqualified him from further service. But it appears that he not only survived the incident, but that his career was accelerated. In September 2018, cousins transferred from Kent Police to the Met, the force police in the capital. Some critics say that it was during this move that vital checks were missed. Whilst in the Met, Cousins gained new friends on the force, soon joining a WhatsApp group where they could be themselves. He was um, in a WhatsApp group with other colleagues where they would speak in a derogatory fashion about females and other members of staff and women in general, really. So, again, that misogyny kind of coming through. Also incredibly racist really? comments were made, yeah. And um, I think comments like, well, I can say this in this group because I know you all understand me. So, again, that kind of hidden behaviour, but also finding his tribe, so finding people that support that from, again, that kind of willful blind capacity. The Independent Office for Police Conduct described the WhatsApp messages sent between Cousins and his group as grossly offensive. I do believe that all police officers, for the vast majority of them, go into the police with very good intention, they care about the community, but you're always going to get that subset of people that are drawn to that profession because they like the power, the control, the authority, the uniform. Cousins' real persona was not hidden from all who knew him. During his time at Kent Police, Cousins had a telling nickname. He was known as... The Rapist. People like Cousins, I believe, are highly emotionally intelligent because they're more actively switching on that desire and that no need to turn off the emotions and to behave in the right way in the right place. So, so you, you can use your emotional intelligence to make people think you are a certain way? Yeah, and I think that's what they do. And I think certainly Cousins did that, because he could perform his job to a certain degree, so he was emotionally intelligent to be able to behave possibly for some of his role in an appropriate fashion, but he was that loving husband and father. We have to remember that. Yeah. Oh. So the disconnect between that 
and what he was really doing outside of the family home shows that emotional intelligence because his wife um, didn't suspect any untoward behaviour. But even a narcissist and master manipulator like Cousins couldn't keep up the pretense indefinitely. Occasionally, the mask slipped, as it did in 2015, when he was reported for alleged indecent exposure. He was finding his urges harder and harder to control. Often why somebody would do something like that, if you think about this as a thrill-seeking behaviour, so if you get someone who likes going on a roller coaster, for example, they would go on the roller coaster and they'd get a thrill from being on that particular roller coaster. But if they went on it again, the thrill is not as thrilling as the first time that you went on it. Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of start to having to seek out the bigger thrill because it just doesn't do what it did last time. So you're always seeking that bigger thrill, that next thrill to get the same buzz that you got the first time. Yeah. And so we see that similarity in this kind of offending. It just doesn't have the same thrill anymore. And we think Wayne Cousins, he was constantly escalating until it came to that night with Sarah Everett. Exactly right. Cousins was finding it harder and harder to keep his true nature under wraps. There were, in fact, six alleged incidents of indecent exposure leading up to the 3rd of March. And when you couple this with criticisms over Cousins vetting before being allowed to transfer to the Met, it seems inexplicable that he was allowed to remain a police officer for as long as he was. There are questions, serious questions, that will need to be answered by the Metropolitan Police. Questions around the conduct of um, the potential suspect at the time um, and all the requirements and the checks that, you know, had or should have been put in place. This case not only sent shockwaves through the public, but within the force as well. Former Detective Chief Inspector Howard Groves has agreed to give me the inside view of how the police now regard the ongoing investigation of how and why Cousins' depraved tendencies were not picked up sooner. We know there was allegations made against Cousins, but what, what sort of allegations were there? There's allegations of um, indecent exposure, allegations of assault, but those matters are still ongoing and subject of criminal proceedings. But he was never disciplined for any of those matters at any point. But I think that there, there has, has to be an onus on his colleagues many of whom would have heard and seen the things that he'd said and done. And maybe though they had brought those things forward, they, they would have been corroborated by some of the allegations that had been made against him. But they, they chose not to. But when you see the end result of what he did and what was known about him before, it would be remiss if people didn't ask themselves or look in the mirror and say, why didn't I not do something before? Even more damning. There are clear signs that Cousins had used his police training and experience to plan and execute this abduction and murder. In such a way, the warning signs were there for all to see. Did he decide he was going to kill her beforehand? We will never know that. But he had certainly had made preparations with some of the items that he bought that he was going to dispose of her remains at some point. But he should have known also as a police officer that the investigation would have been very rigorous and thorough, and with all of the, the technology around CCTV and everything else, the chances are he could have been found. But in his mind, he probably thought, well, I'm a police officer, so I kind of know what they're going to be looking out for, so I will probably get away with it. Knowing what we know now, how do you think he used his knowledge of being a police officer to try and get away with this? There's lots of things, aren't there? We're starting with the way he stopped her, using his powers, using his technical knowledge of restraining her, taking her a significant distance out of London, 80 miles, so immediately removing himself from the abduction site to the next site where he's going to assault her. And then having killed her, disposing of her body, and the planning that then goes in to try and hide that further. So he goes back and buys, you know, building sacks and sets fire to it and tries to conceal her in an area that he's familiar with. Mm. So they've got all that activity. We know he takes her phone, he takes the SIM card out, so that will help to stop um, the phone pinging by turning it off so the 
police on their investigating her disappearance subsequently. Can't work out where it's traveled to. He throws it into water because he thinks that's going to destroy it. Getting rid of the SIM card separately means even if the phone's recovered, that's not there to be able to analyze it. Cousins betrayed the police by using the very training they gave him to try and get away with murder. So what can be learned from this horrific chapter in police history? Sarah Everard was abducted from the streets of South London and murdered in March 2021. It was a callous crime committed by serving Metropolitan Police Officer Wayne Cousins. He'd abused his position as a police officer to lure her into his car before restraining her and driving her to a secluded spot near Dover where he raped and killed her. So many of us relate to what Sarah did. I certainly do. I think if a police officer stopped me and challenged me, I would probably do the same as what Sarah did. And I think lots of females really relate to that in terms of what she did and why she did it. And I think her compliance and the, the sweet nature that she had, it contributed to the fact that he was then finding it much easier to coerce her into the vehicle. His key motivation, I believe, was sexual. Um, and that's why you see that escalation over time of exposing himself, which got progressively worse by the sounds of it in terms of the severity of how he did it. And I therefore think that what he did to Sarah was motivated by sex. Could this have been anybody? We know that he'd been scoping that area for such a long time, looking for essentially a lone female. That was his target. It just had to be a female on her own. So Wayne Cousins, we think, and he was just a predator, and this was a perfect time for him to commit this horrible crime. Sadly, it was. This crime prompted an unprecedented reaction from the public. There was an outpouring of grief for Sarah Everard, but also a lot of anger directed at the police. The bandstand at Clapham Common became a focus for people to express their sadness, shock, and their anger. It should have been a moment of national pause for a young woman whose life was snuffed out cruelly, and instead it turned into a heavy-handed police response where they didn't take responsibility for what one of their own had done. You know what I keep thinking? I went to that vigil and I bent lockdown rules to do so, knowingly. And I always think, what if something had happened to me on the walk home from that vigil? Would I have been blamed? Mm. Or would suddenly the pendulum of swung and the police be looking inwards at their own or be looking at perpetrators and why they're committing violence against women or would the blame have fallen on me? Yeah. I think we all know the answer. There's a lot of bridges that need to be built um, between the community, people, women and the police. Um, do you think that's going to take a long time for the police to be able to earn the trust? I do think it's going to take a long time. There was a survey not long after the vigil and I think 29% of women said they trusted the police. Right. I'm surprised it was that high. Really? And let's not forget the government's role in this as well. The Prime Minister came out saying that violence against women and keeping women safe would be a priority. And yet, have we actually seen anything happen? Nothing is changing. And I think it's just all talk. And I think it's going to take a long time for that culture to move on. I think we should be brave enough to accept that actually there's good men out there as well as bad ones. Yeah. And that we should promote that and those men should step forward to say we are here to protect the women that live with us in society. And also, for men, if you have got anyone amongst you who is degrading to women or you have any red flags, don't be afraid to stand up and say, I'm not sure about this guy here, you know. Perhaps it's just all of us to be braver, isn't it? With this case, what has the, the police looked at changing to try and make sure this doesn't happen again or trying to evolve in the right way? So we know one of the key things was his vetting or lack of. And in fact, I know from my time in policing, the reason for that is funding and resourcing. And it was just one of those things that those resources were put elsewhere. Now, 
that resource and funding is put into vetting, it is timely and it is done for every single post and hopefully that will help make sure that those people like Wayne that should be weeded out are weeded out much earlier. It's evident that Wayne Cousins' attitude towards women, along with some of his colleagues he was exchanging WhatsApp messages with, was disgusting. And thankfully, he was finally brought to justice, but not before taking an innocent life. So on the 30th of September, 2021, Wayne Cousins was sentenced to that whole life tariff, meaning he will die in prison, he will never be released. Subsequently, the CPS now have laid charges against him for those indecent exposures, those red flags that came earlier. And we'll wait and see what happens with that through the due court process. Wayne Cousins stood in the dock with his head bowed, his eyes closed, shaking slightly as he was sentenced. Sarah Everard's family looked at him, then looked at each other with clear relief. But as the judge said, their lives are left irretrievably damaged. Sarah's family, how, how have they been able to deal with this and what are they going through? I mean, it must be horrendous. Oh, it's unimaginable, isn't it? I mean, we've heard very little from them. They're very, very private people, as you would be after something horrific like this happens and just tears your family apart. They spoke very movingly in court. Her mother said how every night at the time Sarah got into Cousin's car, where we're standing now, she remembers her daughter and she has a conversation with her in her head where she says, don't get in the car, Sarah, run, turn away and run. And that just really, really drove home how haunted they are by this and what a journey it's gonna be for them to get over it. I think Cousins will experience deep, deep regret but only for the fact that he was caught, <laughs> for nothing else. And I do believe he would have gone on to do it again. This was a brutal murder that affected us all. Sarah Everard's tragic death sparked a national debate about women's safety and shook our trust in British policing. Something I think will take a long time to repair. Ka 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 ma 
ままで勇行立ち合う負けるなってマジからいなっていく息が鳴ってないそれならには寝てない I'll see you when you're s a d yeah, yeah, sure. I'll keep it all the time, yeah. I never get to all that. We'll be done, so okay. m e n i s a l a yo, yeah. m e n i s a l a yo, yeah. It's a bit of a car, it's a bit of a car, yeah. It's a bit of a car, it's a bit of a car, yeah. It's a bit of a car, it's a bit of a car, yeah. It's a bit of a car, it's a bit of a car. Yes, the next door is in a door to get an easy wish. My son, the little wish, the next door is in a door to get an easy wish. My son, the little wish, the next door is in a door to get an easy wish. My son, the little wish, the next door is in a door to get an easy wish. My son, the little wish, the next door is in a door to get an easy wish. My son, the little wish, the next door is in a door to get an easy wish. So we look more like a fish in the water now. It's only when we're in the sea. Hey, we have no gears to live. So this is a bit new. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able ไอ้เนี่ยเราเป็นเนี่ยนะเอฟซีสนิทมาเฟียลเป็นเด็กสิ่งนี้นะเราเชื่อมเอฟซีเอชเมื่อเฮลมาฟเนี่ยสวัส